I was born in 1961. There, I've outed myself. You can calculate my age from there. My first adolescent political consciousness began with Watergate, followed by the resignation of Nixon as president in 1974. I was just 12 and then 13 years old, and there already was a lot happening for me and my family during that time, including family economic turbulence and substance abuse and an abrupt move from Ohio to New Jersey alongside the discovery that I would soon need a spinal surgery for scoliosis. That's a lot going on. <laughs> So for me, the loss of trust and security and idealism amidst all of these changes within my micro-family system were kind of paralleled with what was going on in the macro-political system at this pivotal moment in my early adolescent development in the 1970s. Now just a decade earlier in 1963, Bob Dylan wrote of his own sense of the impact of such changing times for the different generations, expressing both urgency and caution for what he prophesied and witnessed in what was to come. Now how many of you here were old enough in the 1960s to have some kind of political consciousness of what was happening? Yeah, I suspected so. This is not uncommon within Unitarian Universalist congregations. Did it creep up on you like with a sudden shocking, shockingness? Or did you kind of see some of the seeds, but then it was kind of like full blown before you even knew it? You know, yeah. I mean, it was like suddenly there were cries and actions for justice pouring out on the country on so many fronts. African American civil rights, Vietnam War resistors, the American Indian movement, the women's movement, Stonewall and gay rights. Now, if you carried an identity from one of those groups, perhaps it was not so sudden. You were already part of the movement. But I do suspect that the fullness of all of these oppressed groups breaking into the public square at the same time might have been a bit surprising in its intensity for most people. Now, you don't need to answer this, but if you were an adult then, did you rise up and pitch in and take action? Or did you watch it by choice or ability from the distance and over the television, as my family had to do during that time? Now, today's public events, from first the Occupy movement, to the Arab Spring, to the People's Climate March in New York City, to the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement across the country, to the Standing Rock Water Protectors, to the New Sanctuary and Families Belong Together movements for undocumented immigrants, to the Women's March, and the ongoing national impact of the hashtag MeToo movement, and the March for Our Lives and Never Again student movement alongside the Poor People's Campaign, both of them focused on voter registration that helped to turn the tide for the Democrats in the House. And now, now, the youth-led sun, Sunrise Movement for a Green New Deal and the global youth climate strikes on Fridays. And I know I've left stuff out. So do these waves of movement seem at all similar to the 1960s? Maybe even more pitched. So what should our stance be as Unitarian Universalists when the times they are a changing? How do we side with love and movement building during these times? Particularly when we, as my family was in the 1970s, may already be struggling simply to save ourselves and to move at all. When we have more than enough on our plate for our own survival. How do we lovingly care for ourselves, family, and friends, as well as for our larger world during the storms that currently are raging, with even more powerful storms yet to come? That used to be a metaphor. That used to be a metaphor. This question goes to the root of our call during these times as a people of faith 
and the times they are changing not only for our larger world, but also for you here in Littleton during these challenging times. Now back in 1966 at his UUA General Assembly Ware Lecture, uh, Martin L Luther King Jr. spoke to us with words that still ring prophetically true today. He warned, quote, one of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the new situation demands. He went on, there is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. And there is no, can be no gainsaying of the fact that a social revolution is taking place in our world today. End quote. So indeed, a social revolution once again is taking place in our world today. With life and death at stake for so many. You too here in Littleton have a role to play in these changing times in forging a new shared vision of the, for the ongoing work of your congregational life with and within our larger association of Unitarian Universalist congregations. In the past three years, we have emerged from a conflicted and transformative period in our Unitarian Universalist association with a presidential and more resignations an embrace of the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalist call for teach-ins on white supremacy, and then the election of our first female president. Two years ago, our UUA Board of Trustees held their board meeting at the historic Highlander Center in Tennessee. How many of you know what the Highlander Center is in Tennessee? One, two, three. That's not surprising to me either, okay? Um, they recently had, uh, in the past year, they were um, attacked by an arsonist, um, so it's, it's something to be aware of. They are a grassroots organization that has been engaged in collective movement training and building over the past 85 years. Pivotal work in the South. And it's amazing, folks, and also historic that our UUA Board of Trustees held their board meeting there at the launch of the presidency of our first female president. Our UUA leadership fully intends not to sleep through this particular revolution as they engage in their visioning processes for our larger association of congregations. The times they are a changing. How large and how rooted will your vision be here in Littleton? How well prepared are you to rise up and share in the creation and implementation of that vision with your minister and fellow congregants, as well as with your fellow Unitarian Universalists in your region and across the country and our shared world, because we are an international movement. One thing I do know from experience is that cultivating a vision and sustaining ourselves through the messy implementation of that vision is never easy. And it's also never an individual project. It must be a collective one, all rising up together, each to their own ability and with loving support and recognition of each other's personal story and abilities. A vision rooted in the sense of the abundance of our collective engaged gifts. Now part of that learning happened for me through unique historical and experiential factors and it continues into today in so many ways. Um, I've been involved with racial and economic justice education and action since my young adulthood within Unitarian Universalism, primarily in urban ministry and in social work. And that included nearly 18 years of directing a weekend urban youth ministry program with the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry in Boston. And currently my community ministry is focused within higher education. So at the end of 2014, I taught a very challenging racial justice course at Boston University School of Social Work. One third of my students were students of color and two thirds were white students. 
We were keenly aware of things happening beyond the classroom, particularly all the murders of young black men. Previously, in 2012, Trayvon Martin, which was the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. And now that year, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and young 12-year-old Tamir Rice. The streets were ringing with cries for justice and the Black Lives Matter movement began to take to the larger public stage for the first time. Now, it's not atypical in any class for some to feel more comfortable speaking up and for some to sit listening. Often it's my white students, students who prefer to just listen. And a tactic I learned during the Occupy movement um, to disrupt that tendency was to have the students agree at the beginning to a practice of stepping up and stepping back. Though today I, I use alternative and less ableist metaphors like rise up and hold back. But at that time I was using step up and step back. So in other words, students who are more comfortable speaking out are asked to practice stepping back and listening to create space for others who needed time to practice stepping up to talk to do so. Well, that didn't exactly work for this particular class. A young, highly engaged African-American man expressed his profound frustration, that it compounded his frustration to be asked to step back. No, he said, no, everyone needs to step up. The practice should be step up, step up, not step back particularly for these young white students for whom it was easier and more comfortable to sit and listen than to do the hard and less familiar work of emotional risk and engagement. Now with challenge and support and a lot of grace from this young African American man who did love his colleagues, gradually everyone began to risk entering brave space and to communicate with each other at much more vulnerable depths. The times they are a change in. What worked before may not work now. New paths and new practices are called for, both on the macro level of our nation and here on the micro level of your own congregational practices. So I ask again, how will you here in Littleton rise up in this process? For the times they are calling us to attend together to the most serious concerns ever of our shared lives. And it is our children, the next generation right here in our midst to whom I was speaking this morning, who are facing the most deadly consequences of our failure to find strength in knowledge, analysis, commitment, and collective action. Those coming of age now know this reality well, and they're taking the matters more and more into their own hands on matters of mass shootings and gun violence as well as the climate emergency. That's the new language. We don't say climate change anymore. We say climate emergency and climate crisis. Okay? They will not wait for senators and congresspeople who may block up the door. They believe the evidence of their realities in school shootings and what they are being taught of the climate crisis, including, including the latest United Nations climate scientists predicting that we have really basically 10 years left to prevent the most catastrophic level of planetary change. The times they are a change in. And this is a heavy new reality. So I don't say it this way because I'm looking for you guys to sit there and fall into despair and depression, okay? That's actually individualism when we do that, okay? It doesn't help us. And this is a way that white supremacy and settler colonialism have hurt us, those of us racialized as white, because we tend to experience that it's all on us as individuals, and it's not. Okay, that's why we need to learn about settler colonialism and white supremacy. Because it will help all of us. It will help all of us. The reality can only be faced with humility and as a collective. It's not a time for individualism or heroics and holding up solitary people. Now is the time to hold up movements 
and being part of movements. And as a collective, in that those movements, that's where there's energy and hope. When we sit at home and read the Facebook feeds and watch the television nudes, okay, you're gonna be depressed, okay? If you're out there in a movement and you're part of your collective movement, you're not going to be feeling that way. You're going to be feeling a lot more hope, okay? There's lots of active hope out there. Um, those um, global youth-led climate strikes and how they keep building. There's a next one, major one, is going to come up in April, April 24th, and lots of educational events planned uh, during that week. There's hope to be found um, around the world. Also, with um, in New Year's Day 2019, five million women, women in India, five million of them stood hand in hand and across caste on behalf of gender justice. And, they, and the men were there in solidarity with them, resisting the pelting of, of stones, people who were pelting them, okay? These are powerful movements going on in the world. Those are the stories we need to be lifting up and looking for, all right? Because that's what helps us to stay motivated in this. Now, with all the possibilities of a new vision come all the challenges of specific tasks to accomplish and new relationships and partnerships to forge. It's in the nitty gritty of the change that we often find and need to face our deepest fears and anxieties together. You can have a dream like John Lennon did or Martin Luther King did and many others whose stories are yet to be told in the public square, but it's another thing to implement the vision and dream for the long haul through the thick and thin of whatever new or unanticipated problems you might face and caring for each other in the process. Again, we can only do this together. It's not an individual project or a project of two or three like that social action committee we love to promote and they, we're so happy that all our UU social action saints do all that work for us, right? Can't do that anymore. Everybody has to pitch in. And it also can't be an act of salvation by your minister. Do you, do you know that, right? We're congregational polity. It is actually all of us together. It's not a minister who's gonna save us in this. It's gonna take all of us and the full multitude of our congregations in partnership on local and global levels. Now, the various movement leaders in the 1960s knew this, and many of them trained through the Highlander Center. The fruition that the world witnessed as the civil rights movement only came about after many years of different groups working together side by side, carefully and strategically laying the groundwork. Groups that include the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Congress on Racial Equity, the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee, among others. So for example, the NAACP spent decades building case law to overturn portions of the Jim Crow segregation laws. Now, you've all heard the stock story of Rosa Parks, right? And you know that's a stock story. What is the concealed story? How many people know that there's a concealed story that isn't taught in our schools. A ah, handful, okay. We need to know this, okay, we need to know this history, all right? Rosa Parks was a trained, long time, fierce social justice activist. And she was the branch secretary for the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama. She trained at, guess where? The Highlander Center, all right? Hers was a planned action as part of a collective movement, not just a solitary act of resistance. So we like to think of this little old African-American woman with gray hair, right, who just suddenly said, I'm not going to do it, right? And that fits well in with our individualism, right? If we keep believing that it's all about the individual, we are not going to be able to get through this, okay? It is collective. And it can't be just these trained social activists who know this anymore. We all got to know this history. We all got to learn how to do this, okay? How many of you know the story of Irene Morgan? Oh, two, good, okay. Um, Rosa Parks wouldn't have existed either without Irene Morgan. Or Irene Morgan refused to give up her seat on an interstate bus in 1944. The NAACP took her case all the way to the Supreme Court, 
which in 1946 used the Interstate Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution to strike down segregation laws on interstate buses. Y'all know about those Freedom Riders in 1961? They never could have done what they did without um, Irene Morgan in that case having gone to the Supreme Court. Okay. Why don't we know these stories? Okay. Why don't we know these stories? What are we doing to help ourselves to learn how change actually happens? Okay. And was, you know, I've been doing this for years and I still only recently found out about Mimi Ford, 17 year old Mimi Ford, who, uh, Ford Jones, who risked integrating a swimming pool. And then she was nearly scalded with acid being poured into the pool by the manager. And I, I went and looked for that one because that story that Mr. Rogers won before this last Mr. Rogers you know, one put it up there. But Mr. Rogers was a Methodist minister who was um, a subversive, right? I mean, what he did was he then, after that story happened, right, he had the black police officer and him sharing his feet in the pool. That's what that was about. Okay, that was because of what happened to Mimi Ford Jones. Okay, gotta know this history. We have to learn how to find and retell these stories of resistance and the lessons of collective movement building because that's where we're going to find the hope that's going to sustain us. It takes a lot to embrace the unknown with humility, it takes spiritual courage and what's often called a leap of faith. Because while we intellectually know that interdependence that we lift up in our principles, we need to know it in our bones, we need to know it in our bodies, okay? By being engaged in the practice of rising up, speaking our truth, and building our individual courage in community. Spiritual practices that lead to the actions of being able to create brave space and connected relational space. That happens when we get to know each other in our depths, taking risks, sharing our personal stories, our anxieties, our vulnerabilities, and building our rela relational capacity for that sharing, for that kind of intimacy. Yeah, but then also not to rest easy in our congregations that we have really done this well in our congregations. We need to be able to share that abundance outside with our larger world across lots of lines of difference, including religious differences. So I return now to where I started. What will be the vision here in Littleton as you engage in your work together with your minister and your standing committee? How large and how rooted in your relationships with each other will you be as you envision this next crucial decade? This decade, this decade. Not some other time. Now is the time. How will you, as an individual and community, and with each other, rise up with your fullest open hearts, your compassionate hearts, your forgiving hearts, a little hard thing for us sometimes, to shape and support the implementation of that vision as we face these national and global challenges. The vision of our faith as Unitarian Universalists is shaped by an ancestral community that's very large, international in scope and history. We are just one small but really important part of that long ancestral change. And our ancestors are with us no matter where we go and in how we struggle in this particular moment in time. And we one day will be with them in the legacy that we leave and choose to leave through the spiritual authenticity of the rising up that we do locally and globally. The times they are a changing, and we can change with them. Just don't stand at the doorway. Don't block up the hall. Your old road is rapidly aging. Amen, amen, and blessed be.